some viewers may find the following video disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. Hey everyone, welcome back to Board Games Unlocked, and Brad and I are doing our top 10 essential games. And what does this mean? Well, it really means whatever you want it to mean, uh, <laughs> because this is this was a very hard list for me to make because I didn't quite know how to tackle it. So essentially what I did is I went through all the games that I've owned and played and wrote out a bunch of things that I feel like everyone should own. And then I took that list and then I categorized them based off their mechanisms. So like if I was choosing... I don't know, we were just talking about meadows. Uh, I, I would do like meadows and do dash like set collection. And then I would analyze those and then be like, I only want one of each category in my top 10. Cause I had like four co-ops and I'm like, I can't put four co-ops on a, you know, uh, on a top 10. So I chose which one of those uh, that I would pick as the co-op and then like, uh, and that's the one. And then I rank them off of how I like how much I feel everyone should have this game. Yeah, I did it's like similar. a multi-layered process. Yeah, I actually went in like like each of the eleven games on this list. Uh, they are you know like this was my deck building game, kind of like what you were doing. This is my yeah. engine, you know. Um, and I kind of approached the list as. Um, like let's say because i there's a guy that i that's just joined the game group over uh in joplin and stuff and he's just voraciously just buying games like crazy oh is this the new guy yeah so yeah. it's like if these are the 11 games in my opinion the way i made it that like if you were looking to start your collection mm. like these would be the 11 games to get if you wanted a good wide variety of yeah of the hobby and stuff so so we'll kind of mm. see see how that yeah. goes yeah. yeah i mean because it's like you're gonna recommend different games mm -hmm. to different people so it's it's so hard to be like hey by the way here's 10 games that everyone should have <laughs> like it's yeah i think your approach is is probably better because you you're currently experiencing the like <laughs> you realize how jaded everyone becomes because he's yeah. like oh my god let's play this game and you're like yeah, we, we already played that right right <laughs> so it's just very very funny but i whenever i got done ranking them i was like i'm happy with this oh, like yeah, sure. i think i think if you're going to only own 10 games you're going to be set like with the games that i picked yep. uh there might be better choices but because i also was like I, I was I was running into the, the issue where I was like, oh, well, this game might be a little bit more complex, but I'm like, well, I'm not doing gateway games. Right. So I kept wanting to think gateway. Yes. Yeah. But no, that's that's a that's a different list, which I can't remember if we've done or not. I can't remember either. We've done so, so many. I, I know. I know. And then we will redo some as time goes on. But Anyway, without further ado, we are actually doing something new with our top 10. We actually should have reference pictures now. We'll have the, the board game um, box cover art, right? Yeah, and so then, I, plan, I and, plan on showing the box cover while we talk at the beginning, and then as you're going through the spiel, I'll pop it to the next picture. Perfect. Okay. So that should be nice so we can kind of hone in. as Because I think, what was it, our top 10 or our top 100, we started realizing man, it would be really nice mm. to have uh, to have like a, a reference to point to. So, all right. Well, without... We have done Gateway Games. Okay. We did it in September uh, of 2020. Okay. So, anyway. Yeah, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I, sh I should be first. I feel like I'm always, I'm always first. So, with an honorable mention... Um, this one was hard. Like I said, like I, every game that I felt like I picked, I'm like, man, yeah, you should just own all these. But of course, cause I like the games I picked. Um, but this is the trader mechanic game that I chose. It was one that I feel that if you're going to have a lot of people over and you're wanting a kind of social experience, then this is probably the best, 
uh, option that I can think of. It was between this one and another one, but ultimately I do think that this one's a little easier to grasp and it you just get the same feel. And that is Deception, Murder in Hong Kong, which came out like forever ago. But in this game, everyone is, uh, well, there, everyone, there was one person who is the, uh, murderer the killer and uh everyone else are the detectives so everyone has dealt a roll card and one of those will say killer or something and then one person plays the forensic scientist who knows who the killer is but he can't talk and everyone has yeah there's red cards there and then there's uh blue cards and everyone the killer will secretly pick a one red and one blue as a pair and then that's the method of killing and the, and the murder weapon. And then so then everyone is trying to figure out who is the killer. And by the based off the clues that the forensic scientist gives, there are those those uh, cards, those titles in the middle. And the forensic scientist puts a bullet onto what he's trying to get everyone to point to the two cards that the killer picked. And these are very ba vague, vague, <laughs> like you always have cause of death and location. Like if someone picked an iron and I don't know, explosive, you know, as the two cards, then it's like, what, what are you going to pick for location? Like you could pick, <laughs> I don't know, kitchen, <laughs> and hope that people think you keep irons in the kitchen. Um like and then cause of death you could do loss of blood uh you can it's sudden injury if it's an explosion so those are the kinds of things you pick but the trick is everyone gets to discuss even the killer and everyone only gets one guess everyone has those badge tokens those gold tokens there and you only get one guess and you have to get the pair you can't just get one of them right so it's very difficult uh but I think out of this one, more than any other trader hidden role kind of game, this one feels the most satisfying when you get it right. Uh, just because it, you only get one chance. Yeah, and this one kind of skirts that line. It it's very unique because, like you had said, you know, when you have a lot of people over, it's like a, it's almost like a party game mm -hmm. mixed with the uh, social deduction, mixed with you know, it's exactly it's still popular today like you said it came out a long time ago and it's still one of the better ones that you can yeah. get out of this and stuff so came out eight years ago and this was God. the very first and this was 20... the very first game we ever played together that is true that yep. is true <laughs> yeah it was a uh yeah we played with because it plays up to 12 actually i think we played like yeah. 10 people and you, I personally don't ever like like large player counts, um, but even then, it was still, uh, it was still a blast. Yep. So that was the one that I thought uh, uh, would be the best for um, uh, for the kind of like the the hidden role, like uh, who done it kind of thing. So that's my number eleven. All right, my number eleven is a game that I've played more times than I can count, and it's gonna fit the filler. Uh, game kind of uh, part of this list um and it's just one of the it was the first well i think the first or one that kind of set up the micro game uh category explosion back a few years ago yeah and that's love letter that is um, a good choice this one is so cheap to get um and it's such a simple game i mean anybody can play this game like it i've mm. played this game with my parents that don't do this kind of stuff you know i mean it's just mm -hmm. um and you can play it so fast every every round can it, i mean a round could take two or three minutes i mean it's just yeah. so, super super fast i've went through so many decks of this i've, I've bought i i don't even know how many times i bought this game now because the cards wear out and everything <laughs> but uh but yeah uh, you know and the art is so so but and there's been a lot of different uh versions of this with uh lord of the rings and batman and cthulhu and all, all those different ones i like this one just because of the simplicity of it i almost i want to get the premium version of it it's just out of print mm. super expensive right now but pretty gotcha. much the point of this game if you like like if you look at this picture you're going to play you draw a card you play a card and 
you are trying to be the last person with a card in your hand. So certain cards are going to kick people out, potentially kick people out of the round if if you the circumstances arise. Um, and uh, if you the prince as is the main card, it's an eight number. And if you happen to have it at the end of the deal, you automatically win. Or if you actually have to, if you get have to discard the princess, you're automatically out. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just pretty much last man standing. Draw a card, play a card. I mean, yep. it's um, and in the base box without the because the premium edition has the the two versions of each number, so it gives you more variation. This oh, okay. one, there's this one, there's just you know one through eight, and yep. and so you know what the, they do, and you just go for it. And um, this one also kind of has a little bit of. I mean, very, very, very light um, of the uh, where you hidden hidden roll kind of stuff because the sixteen cards you shuffle up and you always take one card out. Oh so, yeah. So like it could be the princess that's out of the game, you know, mm -hmm. and you don't know, and everybody you may think you know. So it's just like you just kind of go through that. But this is this is probably one of my most played games since I got into the hobby, just because it's so fast and so simple and. Yeah. And everything and and it's is a very a very e easy game to get into your collection and and uh you know play with a lot of people yeah yeah no this is a this is a really good choice i personally own the lovecraft leather mainly mm -hmm. for theme and it adds a little bit more complexity but if you want to go yeah straight pure this is a a really good one because it actually has like it's not just you go through the motions and you draw a card and you're just like, whatever, who cares what I play? There's actually like some strategy to it because you can card count. You can kind of, because you mm -hmm. keep all the cards you play in front of you and you can be like, okay, well, I know there's like six guards and four of them have been played. I have one in my hand. <laughs> like, hmm, if I'm going to play a guard, who do I want to pick? And what's left out on the table to try and knock them out? Yeah. Right. And, yeah. and the thing is, is also you, uh, it's, it sounds, I guess, if you're not familiar with this game, you start the game with a card in your hand. So, yeah. So when you draw a card, you'll have two to choose from to put down. Mm. It's not like you just pick, you know, put down <laughs> the one that you draw because that would be yeah. stupid. So you get a little bit of choice and, and stuff like that. But, but yeah, this is, this is kind of a must, I think, if you're starting mm. out a collection and stuff. All right. Good choice. Good choice. All right. My number 10 is at this point uh, a, a obviously a modern classic. It is part of a, a trilogy of games that I was like, you know what? If I'm picking dudes on a map, this is probably the most, it's not my favorite, but it is easily the more accessible one that I feel like most people are going to gravitate towards and have a blast playing. Uh, so that is Blood Rage! Blood Rage was, oh my God, when it came out, like, I'm pretty sure people like were doing back alley, you know, games of, of Blood Rage. Like they were just like, oh my God, you got, you got any of that Blood Rage. And it was, it's still to this day, extremely solid because uh, obviously we can look back and be like, oh man, that's still a fantastic game. But I'm very curious to see what games that come out now because there's so much so much more hype on kickstarter games and things that i wonder if that hype will still hold like hold on to those games or if it's just like oh man what's the new one we already forgot about 2021 games those games suck like 2022 you know uh so i'm curious to see how that goes but this one still have it in my collection i have everything for it i got it at, on a steal of a of a deal um and it uh, the, the trilogy being Rising Sun and Ankh. And Rising Sun is my favorite, but I understand that not uh, most people don't tend to like negotiation, so which is a heavy part of Rising Sun, and this doesn't have that. Uh, so the, the plan is, is whenever you are playing, you're trying to get the most points, and there's a variety, like a variable way to gain victory points, different types of strategy. Uh, you get points for winning battles, you get points for losing battles, you get points for area control, you get points for controlling the middle. It's a very heavy area control game, uh, and it's all based around card drafting. So you have different uh, levels. Uh, there's one, two, and three periods or ages. Uh, 
that you start drafting these cards and not every card is going to get drafted. Uh, and when you play the game, you might be looking for a very specific one, but that is essentially how your clan is built. So you are forming your strategy and your, uh, your clan uniqueness by the way that you're drafting these cards. And I just, I've had such a successful time every time I play this. And it's weirdly enough, been a while since I've played this, but man, it just looks so good. Do you have the, the next picture? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> there we go. There it is. Uh, oh <laughs> I was like, oh man, maybe I forgot to send blood rage. Oh no, no I'd forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> You're just so engrossed by my voice. Um, but yeah, so yeah, there's the, this was also, well, I think Komet came out before this one, but yeah, it did. Uh, it did. Yeah. Well, both Komet and this one were those kinds of games where you actually could draft monsters and those were yours for like the whole game. And it wasn't just like, oh man, I get this for this battle. It's like, nope, that is now yours. And so that's always just super cool. I mean, even whenever I'm actually playing Komet tonight. Um, and, uh, but I remember the first time I played Komet, that was still one of the best parts of the fact that now you're, you're from the first card you pick, you are immediately different from everyone else. Uh, it's just, it's so good. And the board gets tighter and tighter as the game goes on. That's what, that's what I was going to say that, 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 uh, is one of the two things that I love about this game is how, when the Ragnarok, you know, that the areas get destroyed. Mm-hmm. and all that and then the <clears throat> the rage currency is the other one like how you have to pay yep. the rage to to do stuff that, that's yep. always been my favorite i mean you can parts. get rage engines gain rage each time you kill a unit you could gain victory points every time you release uh your uh, warriors from valhalla you can get there's just a lot of ways to gain victory points in this and Man, it's it's one game. I will say all 10 or 11 of these games, if I ever were to like just go crazy and sell my collection, I'm I, I would keep all of these games. Like so I think if you're looking for a dudes on the map game, there are a ton out there. <laughs> like yeah, like throw a rock and you'll hit one. I do think that this is gonna be the it's it's not my favorite of them. None of these games are my favorite in their particular genre. Otherwise, it would just be my top 10 games. Um, but this one, I think, is going to be the best one, and you'll probably have the most, uh, the better success. So that is my number 10, Blood Rage. Good choice. I, st- I still kick myself for selling my, because I had the all, the all in first Kickstarter, you know? And yep. It was yeah, super expensive, and I wasn't playing it. So I sold it for like 400 bucks. And yeah. No, I don't now you're it. having to pay 500 for it. <laughs> just, I just have, I just don't haven't gotten it yet. I was playing. Yeah. <laughs> no, but, that's uh, fair. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. My number ten is my debt construction game for this list. Um, okay. It's it's simple debt construction because you don't have to do like you know the LCGs and stuff that kind of debt construction. This mm-hmm. is just you take two decks and you smush them together. Nice. And it is smash up. That's interesting. One, I did not. I did not even consider this one. I huh. did just the reason I put it out there is because, um, and I there there were so many that I thought for this list, you know, mm-hmm. and this one made it solely because it's it's a simple deck construction, obviously, but then it has so many uh, genres and themed decks that there's some there's something out there for everybody. You know, yeah. like if you're wanting to play with kids, they can be the pretty, pretty princesses and the, and the kitty cats or, yeah. you know, there's there's just all these different themes that you, I mean, if you don't want to draft and you just want to people pick what they want, I mean, you can, it's it's got a wide range of, of themes, I guess. Yeah. Um, and then it's simple play, you know, I mean, you, you just, uh, you're trying to blow up the, uh, the middle, whatever bases, I guess yeah and go through and do that it's just it just has a wide range of of stuff that i think people it can get a lot of people to the table and mind mm-hmm. you this is only like we have said many times before that this is the best at three yeah. um but uh but this one you know the the art is welcoming the 
you know, that it's just, it's just one of those games. It's like when you, if you have new gamers that come to the table and they're like, Oh, pick what two of these decks you like and just shuffle them together. Mm -hmm. And then, and then that first time they realize it's like, if you pick the zombies and the ninjas, it's like, Oh, you're the zombie ninjas. Yeah. And stuff. And it's like, just thinking about all that stuff and everything. That was always something that, that drew my, my family to this game was Mm -hmm. just picking, trying to pick up funny uh combos and stuff like that but uh but yeah for the simplicity of it and for the basic because i'm trying to think because i was trying to think of this when i made this list i'm i know that there was some before smash up probably but this is the one that i first noticed where you just took two decks and shuffled them together and that was your deck you know like i know there's been a couple since then but i couldn't think of any before smash up yeah, that, it's, that you um, just took two decks and put them together, and that was what you played with. It's um, the first one that I played. Right. Um, God, I don't even remember who I played this with. I remember I went over to someone's house, and because uh, the game store was closing, and they're like, "Well, let's keep gaming," but I don't remember who that was, uh, which is kind of weird. Um, but yeah, I don't. I don't know. No, I mean, I completely agree. This is this is a really good one just because, yeah, it is. Because once again, like, it does have strategy. And, mm-hmm. like, you, uh, whenever you play the game a lot more, you kind of know, uh, especially if you're drafting and you know what other people have picked, you might know counters to those uh, particular decks. Um, and this one, yeah, there's so many expansions to it that if you just want to blow it up and have 90 different uh factions then what was it like 3000 something yeah, different combinations so. which is wild that's just that's insane and yeah you have the different bases that's how you score different points and the game doesn't overstay its welcome either like like that one the was it Evan City Cemetery mm-hmm. it has a base point of 20 and then right now there are uh 9 12 14 points there based off you know abilities ignoring those so once it hits 20 whoever has the most there will get five points and you only go to 15 so it's like oh man you're a third of the way there but it doesn't end up going like super quick but it's also not super long either yeah it's and i think going off the way i made this list like if these were the 11 games that you were going to have to start your collection like if you went down the rabbit hole and got all the expansions for this like the replayability is just nuts on this like i mm-hmm. mean you could just and especially like if you have that randomizer app and it just <clears throat> randomly picks stuff for you it's like there's this is one of those that you just never get all of it two so games I looked up, the same no you are correct yeah uh i looked up games like smash up i'm like okay well maybe somebody will pull up uh, number one is blood bowl team manager I don't Does that? Know. Yeah, I can't remember. Do you smash up? Do you like mix decks together? The only, the only reason that's part because it has the bases in the middle. That you okay. Put. All right. That's that's what I thought because it does. Yeah. You're right. It does have that same concept. Um, no, this is a, this is a fantastic choice, and it's so weird because I never hear anyone talk bad about this game, but it has a bad ranking on Board Game Geek. Like yeah. as a six, and I'm like, well, that's interesting. Like. Because I never hear anyone going up and be like, that game sucks. Yeah. Like, um, huh. Okay. So someone, these freaking comments cracked me up, man. Uh, let's see. Like, someone put gave it a one. He's like, extremely terrible in real life, best in digital. It's like, okay, well, why is it a one then? <laughs> Like yeah. why why don't you give it a five or something and be like okay I hate it in real life but I love it as digital and a lot this of these is, you know this one is strictly because if you play it with two it's not great if it's play not it great four it lasts way too long so it's like yeah. player three is about the best I mean if you're playing this with three it hums like that that is mm-hmm. I should have just on the box said a three, three player game yeah. <laughs> yeah. three dash three it's like oh can right. you play with more no. Yeah, because two is boring. Four just lasts way too long Mm -hmm. and stuff. So it's just like, yeah. Yeah. So anyway. All right. That's that's a real good choice. All right. My number nine 
ended up I'm I was very surprised that I actually kept it on the list just because I particularly don't gravitate towards these kinds of games but there's some that are coming out that are becoming very very you know heavy and very uh strategic i did not pick those i went with still the more strategic it, it does have strategy to it but it is a lot more accessible and you can get anyone to play this and that is cartographers this is my x and right game you know flip and right is this one but it's just like this one was one of the first that i played because i had played um welcome to and i had played oh god there's there's a few others but i'm drawing a blank because they were not memorable in any well, way you'd, play, you'd played roll through the ages those roll were through the ages um through. and and those just were like okay uh but this one it's just it's so much fun and like you actually have to plan ahead because the way that it works is you are a cartographer and you are essentially the theme is you're supposed to like be being a cartographer examining the land and plotting it out on your sheet so you have uh you have that sheet and you have different goals and similar to isle of sky is you have four ways to score points but there are the four seasons and like spring for example you're only going to score for the first two cards and then summer is the next two and then fall is the next is like the next two and then the fourth one is the last one and the first one so you're only going to score each card twice so if you're going to go all in on one uh, goal then it's eventually going to stop scoring but uh you basically have a deck of cards you flip one it's going to give you a terrain type and and different options on uh, how you can put those out. They're polyomino shapes. And then you just pick somewhere on your sheet and you draw that in. And then that's that's the game. Um, this game could have been just very, very simple in that that's all you do. But having those scorecards just elevate this game to a whole nother level. Like, And then... To add more to that is you have monster cards that can, they, they don't always get flipped, but they can. And then you hand your sheet to the next person and then they put that shape of monsters on your, uh, somewhere on your, uh, on your little sheet thing. And you get minus one point for every space that is adjacent uh, that isn't filled in. So they're obviously putting it somewhere that is going to be more difficult, but it's not so difficult. Like, it's not like, oh man, you just totally ruined my game. Like, it's pretty much like, okay, well, now I have to kind of explore around that area a little bit different than what I was intentionally uh, initially wanting to do. But yeah, this one is such a blast. Very quick to play, very quick to understand. Uh, it's enhanced by the heroes and the map packs so if you're tired of the base game then you can easily just get those and it just adds more but this isn't my fa i was thinking dinosaur uh roar and right or hadrian's wall but those i can once again i went kind of more gateway um this one is easier to bring out with a large group of people and and not and still have the strategy versus um I mean, Hadrian's Wall is solo, or mm -hmm. it's it's best solo. Yeah, and Dinosaur Roar and Right <clears throat> is is really really good, but it's pretty complex as well. So this one kind of fit ev fit everything that that those mentioned that those touched on, but still being accessible. So that that was my my role my flip and right pick. Yeah, this one was my flip and right pick too. It just didn't make my eleven. Um, gotcha. This one uh, you introduced me not too awful long ago. It's one that had slipped through the cracks for me. Mm -hmm. uh, then I went and I bought the all the the big collector's box with the colored pencils and all that ah, fancy that's stuff. Great. So, so yeah. yeah, I was thinking, I was listening to <clears throat> Dice Tower. They're doing their top one hundred now. And this that. was yeah. this was I think this was brought up, and you know what I think could be cool is someone mentioned stamps, like people make stamps for this. And I was like, stickers, 
like that could be really neat because i think if they planned ahead because you would you wouldn't need to have like individual squares because you're already given a very specific shape you need to make so I wonder if it would be like you could have individual squares for like the two that are like diagonal, but like right. if you had like the T and it was just you just had a plethora of T's of all different types of terrain, then I think that could be cool if you really wanted to pretty up the game. Colored yeah. pencils is very much the cheap option. It is. Yeah. Well, and some people like to draw their fancy trees or mm -hmm. you know, different stuff. I think it just leaves the creativity. Up. Yeah yeah for, but i just thought if you wanted artsy. to like deluxify it and play a game and then yeah. like really mapping it out is like I, I think it just could be i'm amazed that someone hasn't made those on like etsy or something yeah. yep very true all right well my number nine is a game that we both like i think i actually like it because of what we talked about on our top 100 stuff i think i actually have it higher than you um, but we both like it. This is my Civ building game, and it's a light Civ building game uh, that uh, Portal Games put out. And it's oh, okay. It's 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 you can mess with the deck and you can customize the deck how you want. But they've put I just like the base junk that they've put out with all the civilizations that they have, um, and that's Imperial Settlers. Um, this one is. Uh, I put it as my civ building because it, I mean it is very light civ building. I mean, you're, mm -hmm. it's card. It's a card based game. Um, you start off with your civilization board, kind of in the in the middle, um, and then you uh, have the basic deck, and then your civilization deck, and you're getting cards, and you place them on the sides of that uh, your little civ board, depending on what type of structure it is. Um, and then you can also the multi-use cards are a big thing, you know. Like you can, you can use them for to make a deal with, where you tuck mm -hmm. them upside down at the top of your board, and then you're constantly getting those resources. Um, at the beginning of the round, you just collect all the resources from your deals and all the stuff your cards give you, and all that, all that stuff. So, um, so it's one of those. I mean, you, you lose what you don't spend. That's that's the difference. You know, we talked about that with Empires of the North. Mm -hmm. where you can kind of bank a little bit of it and stuff this one you can but there's a little bit of interaction you can you can raise people's buildings there's uh different stuff like that um i put this in at, on this list because i had thought about some other civ games i was trying to decide and i in this one i went for just because uh while it, it's an easy game, it's still a lot of strategy and a lot of decision making. Um, there's a lot of replayability with all the different civs that are out, even mm -hmm. the, running the fictitious Atlanteans and all that different stuff. Um, yeah. It has a good solo um, deal if you like to go that route. Um, there's even, and I haven't played it, and I know you probably haven't because I think it's still in shrink on your shelf, but the the uh campaign thing for this yeah i haven't i opened it it's not in shrink i can okay, tell you okay. i at least opened it <laughs> mine's still i put it back on my shelf <laughs> but uh so i haven't messed with that but this one just it's 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 a cute the art is just cute like you can look mm -hmm. at the pictures and they have all the all the little people running around doing different things on there and and stuff this is probably i maybe put my foot in my mouth here but this is probably my favorite portal game i believe okay i believe i think that's the case but but um this one just fits i mean it's it it appeals to a lot of people you know like pretty much anybody i've ever played this with has enjoyed it um and uh yeah i mean that, that's that's pretty much all i have to say about it i mean it's it's a it's a good one and if you like and on the on the inverse of this if you don't if you like more of a uh post-apocalyptic theme the 51st state master set is pretty much pretty much the same game just in a different mm -hmm. i mean you know so yeah but. yeah no this was one of the first uh kind of like civ building games that i you know played and kept because like it was always frustrating to build up kind of your civilization and just have someone constantly attack you. And then you're like, okay, well I'm back to, 
you know, square one. And uh, yet while you can attack someone else, you could only attack very specific buildings. And then it's very easy to defend them. Like you just can, you place a defense token and it's like, okay, well, now they have to spend a lot of swords to just destroy this. So it might not even be worth it. So really what ends up happening every game I play is no one attacks anyone and you're just trying to build up your engine. Well, and if you do get something destroyed, you get a wood, I believe, yeah. too. So, I mean, you get something from it, too, as mm -hmm. well. And then it becomes a base that you can build some other stuff upon. No, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. Know, so it's a good design. <clears throat> no, I agree. Very. Uh, it's really nice. It, it, it doesn't look all that, like, exciting out on the table. But the way that it's organized with the, the building types and um, it, yeah, it is, it is very accessible and especially in terms of Civ games, because those tend to be, they can be heavy. Like if you want to try to teach someone civilization on the PC, they're going to have a rough time. <laughs> right. So, and this, this isn't that, and it's not through the ages where it's basically civilization and you'd rather just play the video game or the app. Right. <laughs> Right. So, yeah, yeah, no good choice. All right. My number eight. Uh, this one was actually, I felt like to be a weird one because it does have a nuanced theme. And, uh, and it, it, I feel like it's going to appeal more to a particular type of, of people. But I do feel that the, the game just has, it has more oomph to it. And that is, Role player. This was my dice drafting uh, game that I picked, and it was between this one and Sagrada. But uh, role player just has more to it, and I really think the theme is super cool. Like, obviously, it is a D and D theme. So if you're not into that, then like, maybe stained glass is the way to go. So go <laughs> with Sagrada. Uh, but this one. You are making a D and D character. Uh, when you're set up, you pick a you pick a race. You are given a background, and you are given an occupation or a a class, and you're given an alignment. And those are kind of your goals. Like the background tells you what particular die color you want, and the class tells you what numbers you are wanting in your stats, being strength, con, dex, yada yada. But uh, there are, depending on number of players, there are certain, uh, there's always a number of dice plus one or a number of players plus one of dice that are picked. And so those are rolled and you're looking for specific numbers and specific colors that you slot into your stats. And each of those attributes have like a special ability to mitigate the die. Strength allows you to uh, turn one completely over. So a six becomes a, a one, a five becomes a two, or vice versa. And you can do that with any die that is in your chart. So if you're starting with a, if you need like a dex of 18 and there's only three slots, you obviously know you need three sixes. Let's say you put a one in there, but then you place a die in your strength area. And then now you can flip that one to a six. So very high mitigation. There are in the base game, there's the die drafting phase, and then you go to the market and you're buying uh, items. And those items give you different set collection bonuses. They give you different abilities that you can get. It's just, uh, it's, it's really cool. Like, short of actually just going out for fun and making a D&D character, you're competing to see who makes the best one. And then expansions bring in stuff to do with those characters because the base game was just all right i got 80 points would you get 60 okay well that's that right. versus monsters and minions added you know now instead of buying in the market phase you can go out and fight and then you can try and get victory points that way or um knowledge on the final bad big bad boss monster and then Fiends and Familiars just added more. It, it, it didn't drastically change like the game, like um, uh, Monsters and Minions did, but it gives you a familiar, which is another unique ability that you have, and uh, more areas to place your dice, so you can kind of stall out for time a little bit. But I think for a dice drafting game, this one just... 
it sings. It's so much fun. Like the, it's, it's a absolutely unique idea uh, and works very, very well. So like, I think Sagrada is the more gateway of the, I, I gave up on pictures. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. My bad. I mean, I got to get in the hang of it. I know, right? It's all it's all new. Yeah. Um, but I think Sagrada is easily the more gateway of of it. But uh, this one has the exact same puzzly nature of spatial awareness with your dice, uh, and it, it's just it's just cool. The theme I think is is fantastic. So so yeah, that uh, that's that's pretty much that. I'm I am not including role player adventures in this. Right, right. Like just. Uh, the actual character creation game. Um, so yeah, as you can see, there's the different special abilities at, at the bottom, like Nimble just gives you a point. Uh, stars are worth points. And whoever has well, the most, uh, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, I like how, I mean, you can, you can really role play like this, like your character when you get those, those cards that are character traits, you know, you can kind of start mm -hmm picturing what your character is actually going to be like it's so yeah abstract, you know but well they included character <laughs> sheets as well and i was like i wonder if you could if you could just take that and make a dnd character like i don't see i don't i don't really see any reason why you couldn't because the like the wizard for example like their stats are appropriate to what you're most likely going to want to have as a wizard anyway so if you happen to make them, then uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure, or at least use it as a baseline kind of idea. Like, it's like, oh man, what kind of character do I want to make? And then you could play a game of role player and just be like, oh, all right, well, I got my idea. I'm sure there's somebody out there on the forums that have created some sort of a transfer reference mm -hmm. <laughs> to the yeah. you know? Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, this was my, my dice drafting choice. Yes, and the good. reason why it said number eight, not higher, is because its theme uh, doesn't appeal to everyone. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'd agree with that. All right. So my number eight is a game that we both enjoy quite a bit. Um, this is my deck building choice. Okay. And this one was a hard one for me to decide because I knew I wanted a deck builder on here. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a, I love deck building games. So I was like, okay, which one would be the one that is essential and i chose the one that's the most unique of of a lot of them um and and has those moments where you're like kind of like the stand-up moment where you're waiting for for uh the success and that's i, I, in. I did consider this one but yeah. it did not it did not make my list yeah this one um as far as all the deck builders i considered this one just having that because most deck builders can you just kind of go through the motions you know i mean as much as i enjoy them there's the whole you draw your five you play your deal you buy this you attack mm. that whatever this one has drips with the theme you know mm. like you're you have to prep spells you do this it has the part where you don't shuffle your deck you know which you just flip it over so there's the strategy yeah. of how you put stuff into your discard pile and how you play stuff and the wide variation of bad guys that you can uh fight throughout the deal um it's it this is one of those that the replayability is nuts there's so many different things you can put out in the market mm -hmm. um now with the different kinds of gems and spells and <clears throat> all that jazz that's um and they just keep putting more out i mean there's so much crap for this yeah. Um, you do not have to own all of this by any means. Um, nope. But you can go down the rabbit hole like we both have and have thousands of cards. And <laughs> you know, yeah, stuff. and because yeah, you it, it, they're all just standalone expansions. Although, right. granted, the later ones do have like a campaign that you're going to be completely lost on, like to, if you if you haven't played the previous one. So, I mean, that is kind of a small issue, but. Other than that, you can just pick one up and play them. Yeah, yeah. So, that, yeah, this is this this is just a, a a tight game as well. I mean, no matter how good you are at this game, um, you know we've played it many times now, and it mm -hmm. always seems like, for the most part, 
I mean, the very the very first time you showed me this game is what hooked me to it. Right. Because it came down to the turn order, which is randomized by a mm. deck of knowing, you know, so you don't know who's going to go win. And it came down, there was two cards left in that stack. And if we drew you, we were going to win. If we drew the bad guy, we were going to lose. And that's yep. the kind of things that you don't get in basic deck builders. But then when you flipped mm -hmm. it you, then we knew we won. And that was it. So that that's what I was meaning by the whole standing at the table, like the excitement part, you know, and stuff like yeah. that. So, so yeah, no, this yeah, one's this... a good one for sure. Yeah, this one was the first because I hated deck builders because of like you said, you go through the motions. It's like they're I know this was years ago, but it's like they generally were themeless. They had all, all of them had pasted on themes. And then, yeah, you just draw your five and you're like, OK, I got five money. I'll buy this. And then you just put it back into the, you know, you just put it into the into your discard pile. And I'm like, OK, I don't get why I can't just have that now. Why do I have to wait? And they never they never worked for me but this one because it was it's cooperative i was just like oh okay now i can actually strategize with other people and then that opened the door to now all deck builders are uh something that i do like i actually don't have a deck builder on my list um there were many that were considered mainly aeons end being one but i think it was just uh, deck building and deck constructing were things that I tried to actively avoid. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why, because Aeon's End is a very good choice uh, for a game to have, especially if you're including a deck builder. But, well, and this one's probably one of the more, so far on my list, this is probably the most complex one that I've put on here. Um, yeah, probably. Just because there's a lot of stuff going on, keeping track of your the name list that you're going against. And mm -hmm. um, you... With this deck building, it adds you're trying to keep track of the hit points of Gravehold, plus you're trying to keep track of the hit points of the Nameless, plus you're trying to keep track of your own damage. There's a lot of stuff with this game. This is not the easiest game by any chance, or no, you know. But once you no, take it's, it out, it's very hard. This is this is one of the best. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. All right, my number seven. This one I knew was going on the list, like no matter what. I just didn't know where. Uh, this is the biggest game that I have on the list. And uh, I think if you are going to include a massive, uh, like experience and epic kind of game, then this is definitely the one to, to go for. And that is Twilight Imperium. Fourth edition, uh, specifically, but it, I, I feel like <laughs> just for sheer scope and magnitude, and I mean, damn near perfection in a 4X game, like this one sings on all levels. Like, yeah, I mean, it, it has the stigma of being overly long. And I mean, that table, that Jesus is not. Christ. A, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that is a. It looks like that is a four-player game, by the way. We're we're playing a seven or eight-player game at the end of this month. So am I, I the eighth? Am I? I am I going to be? I don't know. I told them. I don't know if they got Bird in there or not. He's like, oh, go fuck that guy. <laughs> uh, no, I have. Uh, I have played. Uh, the last game I played of this was six. Yeah, one, two, one, two, three, four. Yeah, so a six-player game. And yeah, it, like I said, it is an epic. It, it, the, it the, just that, that picture just very much displays how, how insane it is. Everyone has a different faction. Everyone has, uh, you know, unique uh, technology cards and, um, you know, a unique ability and some uniqueness with like your flagship. Um, but what's fantastic about this game over some other ones is it's not there's no play or well, technically you can be eliminated it someone really they just have to hate you like you were invited as a uh like <laughs> as a technicality because they needed someone else and then they they just try to get you wiped because it doesn't happen um but the best thing about this game is that you're going for victory points. So you have secret objective cards that you can aim for. And then there's public objectives that are 
slowly revealed as the game goes on. So then it's like, oh, you know, have 10 resources or trade goods. And it's like, okay, yeah, I can try and get that. Be the first one to control Mechatol Rex, which is in the middle. Okay, yeah, I can try to do that. And so, because the public objectives aren't, you know, complete them now or you can't ever do it. If you if they're getting flipped and you can't complete them, then it's like, okay, well, like I, I'll just, I'll aim for those. Um, and then you have, of course, your secret objectives that you can, that you, only you know, or they are trying to go for. But yeah, like this one is you're trying to control planets. Planets give you um, like resource power and, and political power. There's politics in this game. That was one of the first things in third edition that made me love it was the fact that politics was included where you can vote based off the number of planets that you have that gives you political power. So you have more voting power and that goes a long way in terms of hey well i don't really like if uh if you're voting to elect a you know elect a player for a specific unique ability that they might now have you may not find that beneficial but someone else might and you have 15 points in political power or you might have 30 and it's like hey by the way if someone wants that i might be able to uh <laughs> to do you a little favor if you, you know, work, you know, do something for me. And this game just, because a lot of, someone was talking to me and he was mentioning that their group always has negotiation in games that for me, I would have never considered Scythe, for example, which I've, I was like, oh, I don't negotiate with people. You can, I guess, but this one very much asked for it. Rising Sun is another good example of, well, that game is literally built on negotiation. But this one, just every every single game of Twilight Imperium is just a blast. It does take a long time. Like, your seven-player, seven, eight-player seven, eight game easily will take the day. Like, especially because I don't know how many of you are new. I think you're new. I've never played it. This will be my first time. Yeah. So you're jumping into the into the deep end. And but I think who, there's about four of us have never played it. I believe you're you're you are in for a, a long time, <laughs> or maybe the people who have played it the longest are just gonna steamroll you. But maybe. that's the thing, is there are heavier games. This game is not difficult to grasp. You have you pick one action card, like, and it has a top ability that you ha that you have to do, and a secondary ability that everyone can choose to do. So, but on your turn, you take a token, put it into an area, you move there. That's, and then like, before you pass, you have to do the ability on the card that you picked. And that's, that's pretty much it. Not every card gets picked. Well, in a seven, eight player game, every card does get picked. Um, but, and then there are five, you know, public objectives that are worth one point and then halfway through two point objectives come out. So then the game kind of starts rapidly approaching because first one to 10 wins. It's just, are you playing with the expansion? Do you know? I believe so. Okay. The expansion is a must. It, it, it opens up the game so much more, but does add more. Yeah. This one I knew was going on the list, but because of its sheer scope and magnitude and, and commitment, like it, uh, it, it, it couldn't go any higher. Like looking at my other, other six, like these ones are a lot easier to just have, but if you're picking, if you, if you're just wanting to have a massive game, then Twilight Imperium is the way to go. All right. I'll have to, I'll, I'll let you know what I think about it. Yeah. I hope you really like it. <laughs> Um, I'll never own it, obviously. There's no reason why you ever should. This right, is one right. of those games that if you have a game group, only one person needs it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So my number seven is a game that I was introduced to this last year. Um, and it is my engine building pick. Um, okay. I thought about several different uh, ones, but this one I thought was the most accessible as far as for the theme and... Um, the ease of play with it and everything. Um, and that is mm. Wingspan. Nice. Yep, that's um, a good one. Yeah, this one, I mean, even non-gamers know what this game is at this point. It's so widespread and out. it's everywhere um, that uh, 
this is probably the best selling game of the past couple of years, I would say, mm-hmm. just because it was it's constantly had all the print runs and everything because it kept selling us getting out of stock and everything. Yeah. Um, and it's it's just a beautiful game for starter and all the work that was put into it by a first time designer, because this was her first game. Um, it was just nuts where every card is a different animal. Um, and it goes into, uh, I mean, it's, it, I, it just had to have taken forever to make this game. I would have thought just because there's a huge stack of cards, yeah. when, especially when you have the expansions and it's like, every bird has a different ability and there's different stacking abilities and and um it looks like the boards here are from the original these aren't the uh oceana boards mm-hmm. but um because the oceana expansion added the wild nectar resource but uh this is just one of those games that it has dice drafting you know you're going to be to get your resources yeah. um you can create some nasty, nasty engines with this. I mean, we've discussed before, you know, people have discovered these crazy ones where they just go berserk and score a bunch. That doesn't happen very often. Um, no, that I've pretty never much seen one. I haven't either. I mean, I've seen good engines, but right. like, I think uh, people are letting you take those cards. Right. Um, and this is just, it's just such a, I mean, the theme is just so laid back, you know, like is, yeah. with this being a competitive game, it's still just like, Hey, there's birds on my board. You know, it's like, <laughs> I can't right. be mad at you. <laughs> we got yeah. all these cute little birdies. Right. And everything. And, and uh, a friend of ours, you know, has showed me about this app that you can get that you scan the card and it makes the bird sounds. Yeah. You know? So it's just, this is just one of those games that just kind of rocketed up. It won all the awards the year it came out for game mm-hmm. you know, and everything. And, and uh, there's a lot of games now mimicking this style. You know, we've talked about uh, that one Kickstarter with the, the dog park, I think, where oh, they have yep, the dog dogs. Park. And then there's, there's other stuff that have come out. I mean, this game kind of is the one that revolutionized this whole nature, the nature game, you know, like, because yeah. now there's like Meadow and Cascadia and all the all these mm-hmm. different games kind of started coming out after this. And it's like, oh, these beautiful, serene games are are uh, popular now. So they've been putting mm-hmm. everything. And it looks like great because I, I love the theme. I think it's yeah, I, it's so welcoming. And yeah, like you said, like the only time that. I mean, there's zero player in it. Well, no, there in, in the there expansion is, that actually started adding um and like uh confrontation like different mm-hmm. types of birds but very rarely i think there's there's very specific triggers that cause them to go off so you're not just getting attacked the entire time yeah and then right. and the replayability because of the the um the 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 point conditions i can't remember what they're called for the the secret objectives yeah yeah i mean there there's those are there's a, a wide amount of those i mean mm-hmm. it's it's just bonkers the amount of stuff that came out of this game you know and it's definitely a well-deserved uh game of the year and won all those awards and everything um so yeah i mean th- th- and it's on here just because like i said because it's it is such a great game it it's, it has a wide appeal and and mm-hmm. i think pretty much everybody needs to have this game in there in there yeah uh, this know, was what? one that this was one that i was like uh that cat's mom wants to play and we've played mm-hmm. one game with her and uh, but she bird watches and has like bird like books and like mm-hmm. yeah like uh and this one like you said is super welcoming and i think a lot of people expected it to be oh man this is gonna be for kids and then right. it's like oh god no this actually has strategy to it uh yeah, this one is definitely, this is going to be one of those that the hype, like this, you know, like Blood Rage, I mentioned like 10 years from now, it's people will still be talking about Wingspan. Yep, it's kind of like the ticket to ride of this, this deal, you know? Yeah, yeah, good choice. Yep. Very good choice. I 
No, we'll, we'll have. I was, I was about to say, we didn't talk about if we're going to have any crossover. I think we will have one. Um, I know we're going to have one because I know I have one coming up that you, oh. had, <laughs> that you had said, but I don't know about the rest. Gotcha. Maybe two. All right. So my number six was my polyomino pick. Uh, and just because I love spatial awareness games uh just do it for me like they they click and i there's satisfaction of it's kind of because i've always liked puzzles like physical actual puzzle pieces um just because your your brain is engaged the entire time uh and with actual puzzles it could just be in sheer frustration because you're like where the does this piece go uh but in with polyomino games it, it has that same concept of just be trying to fit everything perfectly. And whenever you do it, then it is satisfying. And I went with Sorry. Isle of Cats. <laughs> uh, this one, there are obviously other polyomino games that should be like, uh, that, would, that would probably be people's first pick. However, this was one of the the things where I was like, well, I'm not doing gateway games. So I'm not picking a gateway polyomino game. I'm picking one that I think everyone should have. And this game should not work as well as it does because it feels like a mishmash of different kinds of mechanisms. But man, does it just work so well. So you have basically you have different types of cats and you can draft or pick those specific type of cats. Cause you're trying to do a set collection. You get, you get uh, a certain amount of points depending on the, the families of cats. So at the bottom left, it shows you the scoring and the theming is you're going to some Island to rescue these cats. Cause some evil guy is going to like skin them or something. I, I don't, I don't know. Uh, some horrible monster is going to go kill these cats. And you're trying to get as many as you can off. But so the, the different colors mainly represent uh, if you're like, for example, like the cat families is whenever you're scoring. OK, well, this person has three orange, so he's going to get eight points. He has four red, so he's going to get 11 points. This game rewards you with points all over the place by the end of it. But you're us utilizing fish uh, to be able to uh, get certain types of, of cats. You have, because um, you also need baskets that, uh, so you can actually carry the cats to your boat. That's how you put them onto your boat. Uh, but you need, um, the coolest thing, one of the coolest things about this game is the fact that you, uh, like, there's those blue cards, and those are secret objectives and you get a bunch of them. So you'll have like tons of ways that at the end of the game that you're aiming for to score uh, the, to score victory points. Like what they call, I guess they're called lessons. But what's neat is whenever you pick up those blue cards, you either decide, do I want to keep this and go for it? Or do I want to discard it? And now it's a public lesson. So you're not always going to be able to have the cards in your hand. So then you're getting rid of them. And now that's all of a sudden something that everyone else can go for. And that's a very unique idea. The fact that what you're getting rid of is now available to everyone else in terms of scoring victory points. I don't think I've seen that in other games. I've seen obviously getting rid of cards that people can take, but right. victory points I haven't seen. Um, you can get treasure, uh, uh, like treasure pieces. Those are the ones that are going to be like your one square, uh, similar to like Baron Park and things where you obviously you, you can't always mishmash um, like everything together. So you need like the one piece to fill it in. It's just, it, it works so well as a polyomino game. It has depth, a, a welcoming theme. And it's, it's like, there is strategy but it's not heavy. Like this isn't a heavy game. Like Feast for Odin is a fantastic polyomino game, but oh my God, is that not hitting the, that's not going to hit the table all that much. All right. So this one, I wouldn't recommend Feast for Odin for everyone, but if someone's like, what polyomino game would you recommend? What should I, what should I get? I'd be like, have you played Isle of Cats? 
then if not, definitely check that one out. So obviously this one is, if you like cats, it's going to be more enhanced. Like, <laughs> but I think this isn't like a make or a ride or die if you hate cats. <clears throat> so, yeah. yeah, this is one that uh, I've always considered. I haven't played it yet. I know that I could probably get my wife to play it. Um, mm -hmm. So I'll probably pick it up at some point. Yeah, I would highly, highly recommend this one just because, like I said, there's so many different ways for because you're also trying to cover up the rats that are on the boat you for every rat that's available then um you have minus one point and also rooms the one bad thing about the board is the rooms aren't immediately apparent on kind of what because you lose five points for each room that isn't completely covered uh and you you can but in this picture just still makes it very difficult to be like okay what is a room but it's uh it's so good this one, this one I had to put on the list mainly because I don't see, I, I don't see this one being picked a whole lot for people's essential. Right. But if in the polyomino genre, which I love, it's this one probably would be my favorite. Um, and if not, then it's going to be one that I think everyone should have. Yep. All right. It looks good. All right. So my number six is our first crossover. Yay, it's Blood Rage. No, it's not. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping to get it on the first try. No, I'm pretty sure it well, I don't know what it is. And I'm not I'm not even looking at the right thing. Uh all right. Uh role player it is. Yeah, it was my dice drafting choice. Yeah. Um <clears throat> and this one is just awesome as hell. I mean it's the base game will get stale after a while. You definitely need to add the monsters and minions. It's almost a must. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, just the the you can use your imagination so much on this game, like we talked about earlier, when you're doing those trait cards, and you know it's it's just it's just cool. And what another thing I don't think we brought this up on the last one was that when you when you choose your race, it's double sided. So there's a male oh, yeah. and female version of every race as well. Um, mm -hmm. So when you are uh, doing that, and it's just it, it's just so cool. I mean, I was late to the party on this too. This game had been out for a couple of years before I played it for the first time, and mm -hmm. uh, and fell in love with it. it plays great solo. Um, yeah, and yeah, stuff it does. too. It's it's colorful like you can see the dice i mean the the expansion the monsters mini adds a dice that goes from like three to nine i think um but it doesn't so, count or eight it i think it's, it's eight, or eight. Nine, yeah. yeah eight but it doesn't count towards a color you know mm -hmm. so like um and everything so it's just it, it was just you know they they really hit the hit it out of the park with this and with this being the first game in this property that they created, now they went on to make, they went that whole direction with the role-player adventures, you know, and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, which I think is going to be the way they're going to keep rolling with this IP. Um, yeah. Rolling so, with the IP. Right. Right. <laughs> nice. But, um, but yeah, this is just a, a, a really good no brainer. Like you had said, if you, if you don't like this theme, then I guess Sagrada would probably be more your deal, but mm -hmm. I. But that's the, that was the hard part with the essentials because it's like the, all, the games have themes. So like, if someone was like, "I think everyone should own Ticket to Ride," it's like, "Well, I don't like trains," you know. It's like, okay, well then, never mind. I guess you don't get it, you know. Right. Um. So that that's kind of theme was almost ignored a little bit when I was making the top ten. Yeah. I just kind of went with this one too, because when I made this list, like I'd said at the beginning, these are the 11 games. I think if you had 11 games, in your collection and you wanted a wide variety, this would be one of them. And most of the people I know like this kind of same, you know, so that's why I went with role yeah. player. Yeah. Um, this one, when I was doing, when I was having my bachelor party, I uh, like everyone there is in my D and D group. And so I was like, Oh man, like, this will be perfect. And it, it plays up to five and I had six and I'm like, 
damn it. <laughs> like, I, yeah, I didn't want to sit, have anyone sit out. I guess I could have, but then that's just kind of weird. My bachelor party and then they're playing and I'm just there. I wonder how much it would mess it up if you went with six instead, you know? I don't and know. Just... It is weird that they did choose five as the max player count. Because, I mean, we've done over the years, I've played games that won over the count. You know, mm-hmm. just to see how it plays, and it doesn't necessarily hurt it that bad. I mean, it just makes yeah, it yeah. You technically don't have like a initiative card, like to play up to six, so That's you true. would just have to pretend. Um, yeah. But yeah, I never try to do stuff like that. But yeah, it would be nice if it did play at least up to six, because every time I want to play this, it I have six people, mm-hmm. and. That's whenever it would be perfect, but no, you're right. Um, actually, speaking of which, how much does role player adventures go up to? I bet four. I think four as well. Yep, one to four. Best at two is what people are saying, but yeah, no, fantastic choice. Um, if you don't like D and D, get over it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's my number six. My number five is the first game on my list that you don't like. Uh, I don't think, I think you're indifferent on it, Uh, but this was my engine builder choice. And mainly because it is a pure engine builder, but you actually have direction in where you're going uh, with it. You're not just trying to amass, you know, uh, money, or you're not just trying to amass resources. Uh, you you do amass that that is ma- the main goal, but you actually spend those resources on stuff that generates you the points you need to end the game. And that is Res Arcana. <clears throat> Res Arcana is, I mean, at like I said, at its core, a very simple uh, engine builder. You are dealt eight cards, and you look through those and that you kind of try to figure out what what strategy you're going to go with those eight cards and then you pick your mage who should hopefully help you um, synergize that engine a little bit better and you are um, basically getting essences which are the different resources that you use to activate cards to play cards or to get the places of power which are generally going to get you your victory points so in this picture, for example, <clears throat> the mage is the duelist. He lets you tap him, spend a uh, death, which is the black, and then to put a gold on that card. Um, gold is used to uh, buy monuments, which are other ways to get victory points. Or you have the elemental spring that on collection you get a water, um, a life, and a Ellen, I think is what it's called. <laughs> Fire, water, and life. Uh, that allows you to w- react to a, if someone's attacking you with life stealing, you can spend a water to ignore that. So that's just kind of the general idea is you're trying to collect, constantly be collecting essences to then pay, like for the sunken reef, for example, costs five water, two fire, and two green. Um, but you collect gold every turn, and then you can do certain actions to put water on it, which give you a point. Um, that's really how the engine goes. And you're just doing that. You go through, you do go through the motions. Every pure engine builder kind of has that. But for me, this game just goes by very quickly. It's so many different engines. Like, like I said, you're only get, given eight cards and it's not like a specific type. Like it's just shuffle that massive deck and here's eight, and then see what engine you can build with this. And that to me is is the highlight of the game. I did actually see someone, um, hold on, that came with a variant that they play uh, that I thought was interesting. Because we, we have thought about doing different ways to play it. Um, let's see, let's see if I can find it real quick because it was pretty recent. It is because uh, it was about the drafting, the different types of of drafting. So he said, "Well, I can't find it." So, so oh, oh, go ahead. In that oh, no, picture, no, no, go ahead. I ha- I haven't found it yet. In that picture, is that I don't remember playing it. Was that sunken reef card that much bigger than the other stuff? Were there different size of cards? Well, those that's that- the the cardboard. 
Those are the places oh. of power. Oh, oh, never mind. Never mind. That that's are... right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, let's see. Let me filter that. And nope, still can't find it. But that's okay. Unless he deleted it. But I, I don't hate least... this game after playing. I just I'm kind of indifferent on it. You know, uh, it's it's good for what it is, for sure. But yeah. Oh, wait, here it is. Um, the core rules of Res Arcana has a variant we played since our second game for drafting. It's a draft four two times to create your initial set of eight. Then pick your mage, which was already in your hand. So, so that's, I guess they did have a variant, which I don't remember ever seeing. So someone did mention that on our top five expansions. And I'm like, oh, okay. So that gives you some control over... Uh, uh, over what like what initial eight cards you have but yeah right. like i i like engines in games they're so much fun especially whenever you start really having them pop off but but like i don't just like having them i want to do something with them and this one lets you do that because you can get the places of power you can get the monuments and once you start getting those in the game uh is is ramping up to a close so it doesn't over states welcome for me right. uh, so yeah that was my that was my engine builder choice uh res arcana all right well my next one was probably my hardest decision to make of any of these picks and it's in the worker okay. place worker placement mechanic um because okay. i love worker placement there's so many games that i considered for this but at the end of yeah. the day, there could have only been one that I could could have chosen. And that is Damn. Raiders of the North Sea. Uh, um, I was really hoping you were gonna pick Vidi Culture. Because <laughs> I had the same, I had the same problem with worker placement. And yeah. it came down to the game I chose in Vidi Culture, and I didn't pick Vidi Culture. And I'm like, Brad, I'll probably pick that one. <laughs> no, I I mean that was in the uh, there was this, and um I considered like whistle mountain with but i put that out because of it has that's a smaller mechanic of it um yeah. this one i ended up choosing because um this was the first worker placement game that i played that did the where you place a worker and pick up a worker and you get the two actions you know mm -hmm. so this is a pretty simple worker placement game as well for i mean i know there's a lot of there's strategy to it but but as far as you're going to place a worker get that action and that's what you normally do in a worker placement. But this one, you place the worker, take the action, pick up a worker and take that action. So you're getting to do a lot more on your turn. And it also adds that layer of complexity because whatever you pick up is going to open up a spot for somebody else to drop their person down. You know, so it's like there's that kind of ebb and flow and everything. And um, with this game, you know, you start off at the bottom of the board in the village area you're, and you're kind of, uh, there's three different, there's, there's gray, white, and black meeples that you are using. Um, and they, some spots require certain colors. Um, so you're kind of building up your, your uh, rating party by picking up the cards with the wonderful art by the Miko on them. And you're um, going to bring them up. And then, uh, and there's all these different victory point tracks. So when you go and you actually decide to go raiding up uh, across the sea and you start raiding and doing all that stuff, there's these piles of, of uh, resources like gold and different odds and ends. But there's also these Valkyrie tokens. So whenever you get a Valkyrie token, you have to kill off a one of your crew members, but then you go up on the Valkyrie track and that's another way to get victory points. Um, so, I mean, you roll dice because in the upper left of the your crew cards, there's a number. You use those numbers when you're raiding and you have to get to a certain number to be able to successfully raid. Um, this one has a couple of expansions that have come out that have made it even, even better. Um, there is now mo most of the shim Phillips games that come out now with the, the West Kingdom series and all that stuff come with the solo variant in it this one didn't initially mm -hmm. so i actually had to buy it's a little deck of cards and i bought them from 
wherever Poland or wherever this this they are from. Um, and it's it's just such a simple uh, solo automa system that comes into it, but it's awesome. It works with all the expansions. The board is beautiful. I have the I have the play mat for uh, this as well that adds all the extra sideboards for the Hall of Heroes and and uh, Fields of Fame, I believe is the other one. Uh, this one just I considered Champions of Midgard, Viticulture, I did too, actually, yeah. This um, Whistle Mountain. There's just a ton of worker placement games I could have chosen. I went with this just because of the uniqueness and the simplicity of play. For uh, you know, and it's it's kind of got that welcoming look to it because that art is just beautiful on those cards and everything, <laughs> and uh-huh. everything. So so yeah. So Raiders of the North Sea. That's the one I ended up choosing. Uh, this is still to this date. Now, mind you, I haven't played Viscounts, but this is still my favorite of all the games that he's put out, even over Paladins and and Architects and all those. So. There you go. Yep. It's like a so. goblin orthodox Jew is what I apparently <laughs> made him. And he looks, looks like, like Spock. <laughs> <laughs> he has like a, I tried to make the Viking helmet and I gave him rabbit ears and he has like a cup head and like a, a luchador mask. So I don't know what the fuck this guy is, but that's how I, that's how I picture every human in his, in his games. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. So what close. I tried to do yeah. is. I did like a combination of all three of those main guys, like the, <laughs> like the left guy's horns, the the helmet, and then the beard. And you know what? I'll give it to him. He, he's definitely a better artist than I am. <laughs> Not by much, though. I got the hold on, wait. I got the nose right. There's the nose. Oh, the crooked nose. Yeah, the, the fucked up nose. Yeah, yeah, I got that right. Yeah. All right, but yeah. So this was this was my worker placement choice. It was it was a tough decision though, for sure. Yeah, that one was probably the hardest, hardest uh, one for me to pick as well. All right, my number four is this one is my co-op pick. Um, well, actually, that's not true. I okay, I lied. I do have another co-op, but this one is my big heavy co-op, which um, is just it, it. It is my favorite cooperative game. And I think if you're going to want to go for one that is heavier than the, um, than the rest, this is probably the one to go for, especially if you're like, well, okay, we're beating this co-op quite a bit. Like this one has the accessibility to change it uh, drastically. And that is Spirit Island. And it also has a very uh, unique theme, like it flips on its head where you're the the island is killing the uh inhabitants not, not the inhabitants but the settlers <laughs> um <laughs> it's just like no one can be on our island uh no this one is a very very complex um cooperative game where everyone is playing as a unique spirit that has a unique way to play uh, special abilities and unique uh powers like card powers and where the board doesn't quite like this game looks weird like the art on the of the spirits themselves are really really cool but in just terms of production it it's very strange but i think they chose that in terms of like um accessibility to play because a lot of your powers rely on very specific regions and uh the the settlers inhabit uh, specific regions, so it's just easier to be able to immediately see what what they're doing, which I appreciate. So your whole goal is to generate fear, and you do fear through a variety of ways, but uh, the main way is by removing pieces. There are three different settler pieces. There's uh, cities, then uh, towns, and then just regular people, and you generate fear just based off of uh, if you if you destroy a city you generate two fear a town gives you one and inhabitants get you zero um but as there's a pool of fear tokens once that is emptied then you get a fear card and you can technically win at any point in the game if you completely remove them from the board 
I have never had that happen. It is very hard to do that, but potentially theoretically possible because uh, there's no one to there's no one to be afraid of you if there's no one to be afraid of you. <laughs> uh, but as you generate more fear, then the requirements are less. So like the first tier, you need to remove all of them. Second tier, you just need to remove all cities and towns. Third tier, you just need to remove all cities because at that point, they're all fucking freaked out. But they are coming into onto the island and blighting the land, and that's how you lose a similar kind of pandemic feel where if a land is blighted, it gets blighted again, then it spreads. So, um, But the synergy of this game is just... It's, it's just so beautiful. Like, m- some co-ops, pure co-ops, can tend to lead to... If someone's played it a lot, they kind of know the strategies or can uh, provide help um more than what someone could be like well i want to do this it's like well you can but that's not necessarily that efficient it's like okay well i'm gonna do it anyway all right well then that's that this one because of the slow and fast powers everyone has like you can do fast powers which go before the inhabitants um and then the inhabitants go and then i keep saying the inhabitants it's settlers then the settlers go and then the slow powers kick off so just working with everyone on what their unique abilities are, what powers that they can do, how you can spend elements to then be like, okay, here, because you know what they're going to do. You know, the settlers are going to, they're going to build in this particular region. They're going to um, uh, uh, ravage a particular region. So you have that knowledge and then you can be like, okay, well, we don't want them to ravage here because that's going to be very bad. So let's try and, you know, use our powers to remove them from doing this. It's like, okay, well, I can push them into this region where you're at. Oh, and then you can do this. Like, and then they're like, oh, I have this power that I can play. It's, it's easily the best. So it's understanding your spirit, understanding how the game works. And you can even give the settlers a nationality to give them special abilities. This is not an easy game uh, to win. It is also not an easy game to understand. And so I thought of Eldritch Horror as my big sprawling um, co-op game, which is, I, I mean, it's probably, be, oh God, it'd probably be my second favorite uh, co-op game. But this one just has that extra, everyone is involved the entire time and you can combo off with everyone. So that's why I picked it. I can see the greatness of this game. It was just, it didn't like really hit home with me. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a good game. I know it's a good game. It's well designed. It just wasn't, didn't super click with me. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that that does make sense. Like, uh, like if it's, if if for some reason, I don't, I don't know why I'm, I'm actually baffled that this one didn't work quite work for you but yeah i don't i can't put my finger on why either i don't know mm-hmm. i'm just not sure well i remember when we played it like you liked it then you tried it solo so maybe this was one of those instances where solo was just too much it was just too much yeah yeah this yeah. Was, this one for solo is just way too much i stuff. think because of the synergy it's harder to be like okay what con- like what you're just kind of like you can become AP prone, not you, but like being in a solo gener- like uh, environment. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you're bouncing off another person, like you might be, they might help you see something that you weren't originally seeing by yourself. Right. And that's a lot of it too. Yeah. This is definitely more of a co-op over solo, even though this gets rated really high on solo lists. Yeah. It's yeah. just, I, there's a lot of other solo games I'd rather play. Yeah, that's fair. So this was my big co-op pick. Yeah. All right, so my number four, I didn't really know how to categorize this game. I just, because it doesn't really fit in a in a particular category. I call it my man call a game, but I don't know. I know that's, <laughs> that's not, that's, that's too narrow. Um, this is my favorite Days of Wonder game. Um, this is, was a game that was ranked number one for me for a couple of years or right out there um mm-hmm. and uh well, i'll just go ahead and go for it it's five tribes um 
I wasn't really sure how to categorize this because it's unique. Yeah. No, it has it has, its... has has man call it as a mechanism. Yeah, I and mean, I was trying to do with more mainstream mechanisms though, but this one I knew had to be on here just because. I mean, because it, it has it has a kind of a mismatch of stuff, you know, because it has the your um uh your betting kind of or not betting whatever the term is I'm looking for, but as you're wagering for player order. Um, mm-hmm. It has set collection. It has the Mancala thing. Um, but uh, when you look at the board, I mean, you just – you're laying out the tiles. It's going to be different every game for the most part. Um, and you just cover all of them with meeples, and you're going to pick up the handful of meeples and move them around, and you have to make sure you land on a space that has a meeple of the same color. And then you get mm-hmm. to take the action of however many meeples you pick up. Um Yep. The the thing about this game that I also like is how the money is directly correlated into victory points. I mean, your yep. money, if you have 10, 10 coins, it's 10 victory points. I mean, so you when you spend money or when you wager money for your player order, you're spending victory points to do that. So you have to really um, consider, it's like, oh, I'm going to spend eight coins so I can go first, but then got to you're if you're only going to do a six point action you know (laughs) because that then it's not smart so um the one drawback to this game is there's a lot of of ap because you Mm -hmm. have zero zero idea once the game once the turn order goes around back around to you the board's going to be completely different so um i'll pick like my trick is i'll pick like two Mm-hmm. two or three yeah. options and be like okay and order them but this is one i really want to do okay well he he took that or he moved into that so that's changing so i'll go to my second one right but even and then you're right it's like they could change it in a way that you're like oh okay now there's a new option right right and and that's the thing with these the expansions were awesome too because that first one came out and it made it where the board uh gave the mountains and the mm-hmm. pit and all that stuff and um, the other one added some more stuff where it added um, some different uh, gins. It added uh, cities, I think. Yeah, and then the, the the other big thing that the first or second expansion, I think it was the first expansion added, was the the purple meeples. Yeah, that added the stuff. So then you were able to buy like these these items, you know, that mm-hmm. were hid- hidden stuff, you know, when you got them and everything that could be victory points or or stuff it was just this this is one of those games it's kind of a mishmash of several things but in my mind i think it's just unique enough that um it 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 would keep getting to the table with with Mm -hmm. the group you know um and there's a decent sized stack of those gins that that you can uh get that are powerful you know some are more powerful than others but but um that one expansion, the last expansion, I think, gave it a little bit of mitigation for the gens. And I haven't played that expansion a ton to really yeah. get that. But but I know that um, it just looks gorgeous on the table when you're dropping your camels and you're dropping your uh, the little palm trees and the, mm-hmm. and the buildings and stuff like that. Um, so, but yeah, so Five Tribes is my number four. Uh, and like I said, it doesn't really fit a super specific category other than just, it needs to be in a collection, I think. Yeah. I, uh, I still have never won this game. Um, (laughs) I, there's, but it's still so much fun to play because like, there's just, there's so many options like right off the bat, like just looking at like just looking at this picture here, it's just like, oh man, okay, I can do the bottom left and move the two green in there and take the yellow and then the yellow give me this ability or I can, and then you get to do the ability of like the action they, or the space that you're on. Yeah, there's there's a lot that is in included just in the base game. And uh, every time you set it up, it's going to be different. So yeah, this is a good pick. Yep. All right, my number three. This is my worker placement game. This is the one that I chose over Viticulture, and I kind of combined it with a... It's, it's another type of worker placement. Uh, Viticulture would, would have been my standard true blue worker placement. 
like you just take a worker, place it, do the action of the space you're on. This one doesn't necessarily have that, but it has so many ways to get victory points. It is truly a perfect game in terms of worker placement and the expansions just add way, way more to it. And that is Teot walk on. This is a dice worker placement game, uh, which I, I mean, more or less, you don't necessarily roll your dice. Your dice just get stronger uh, as you use them. Uh, this, like, I just played the newest expansion, and my friend and I were just still talking about how amazing the base game was, and then just how the expansions enhanced it even more. Uh, but you are... Yeah, so you have your workers. They have the pit values represent the strength of those uh, of your workers. So you never roll them, but you uh, so you have three out on the board. So the red player, I'll use that as an example, has a five, and you can move them. Uh, you move them counterclockwise on those different sections. Those are the worker placement spots. So. Like if you're wanting wood, you can move that red five down to two where the other yellow five is, but you have to pay cocoa for each different colored die that's there. But then depending on the number of your dice that are there and the value of the one you just placed, you'll get to go on that chart. So if you place a five there, well, you have one die, but it's a value five. So then you do that kind of multiplication table and you're going to get two wood. So you utilize resource collection, you spend resources uh, to uh, get variable uh, like technologies or uh, to build mainly stone and wood are used for that massive pyramid that's in the middle, which is another way to generate a bunch of victory points. To the left of that pyramid are the three uh, tracks of red, green, and blue. Uh, green lets you get cocoa, red gives you uh, victory points, and blue gives you uh, any other resource that's not cocoa. So trying to get higher up on that track, you'll get victory points the higher you are. You get a bunch of victory points for building the pyramid, because the way the game can end prematurely is if <clears throat> the pyramid is finished, which I have never seen. I have never, like, no one goes that route. I did have a friend, he tried doing that. He was the only one constantly building to go there and he got pretty close but you have to have almost everyone participating to get that done i think uh but this one just you're you're just doing so much i mean yeah, yeah like in worker placements you're doing a lot to get resources to then spend those resources on something else um and this has that just with the element of <clears throat> increasing your dice uh, dice power. You even get something when you hit a six. It like ascends. They die, but then you go up on the Temple of the Dead track, and then you get a power for that. Well, not a power, but you get like a, a bonus. You can get five points or five cocoa. There's just a lot that's going on here. So I wanted. I didn't want to think a, a, a um a simple worker placement, but I didn't want to pick a Vila Lasarda game either. Um, cause I don't think everyone should have that in their collection. I think very, very sick people need Beatles, sorry to games <laughs> like me. Um, but yeah, this one was like, I think, uh, I think I like this one over Viticulture. So I, I do believe that if you want a meteor worker placement, this one is going to, uh, do a lot, a lot for you. So this is the one I think everyone should have in their collection for worker placement. Yeah, I just ordered the first expansion finally. Sweet. I, it came back in the stock. So nice. Nice, nice, nice. Yeah. That so, is uh that is such a good one. Yeah. All right. So my number three is going to be it's not a cheat, but it's it's kind of I'll explain it. It's four games. So, I couldn't decide. So this is my number three. Co-op but slash campaign game. Okay. Um, and the one that's gonna be on the screen is kind of the intro version that came out after oh the, i know okay. regular version um i'm glad so you I'm, put this on because I'm, i didn't yeah i'm kind of i'm kind of clumping them all together you know mm -hmm. because i think if if you do the first version you're going to want to do the second version so it's kind of this whole world is what you need to get and that is i put gloomhaven jaws of the lion because that's the perfect nice. entry point into um the big Gloomhaven slash Frosthaven when it comes out uh, mm -hmm. game. 
Um, yeah, and Blue like Haven. It, yeah. <clears throat> Go ahead. Sorry. I, I was just going to say that this is this slash Gloomhaven would be the essential part to start with this, go to the Gloomhaven um, because this is the, this is the campaign game. um, In my opinion, as far as if you Mm -hmm. want a long sprawling campaign, uh, good story, the, the um, foreteller app is superb with this. Um, with the with the on your channel, you know, with the the playthrough that we're doing with Jaws of the Lion, it's it's yeah pretty badass with the character creations and stuff. Um, this one I think is a necessity for if you want to play a campaign game. This one's just like the per- perfection. You get you're gonna get your money's worth out of playing this and regular Gloomhaven for sure. Yeah, I I considered so many campaign games and gloomhaven was the one that was going to be my my initial choice i actually don't have a campaign game on my list which is strange considering the fact that i love campaign games but i think i ultimately deterred myself away from it because it is such a commitment more so than any of the other games you to play them once and then you're like man that was fantastic but with a for to be for me to be like with a campaign game to be like everyone should have this well that means that everyone should also have a group a consistent group to play with not that i mean gloomhaven is is a a masterful game in my opinion and i'm so but i'm glad you mentioned it because i was so conflicted that i didn't put one on my on my list but no this is definitely a fantastic entry point especially i guess if you're going to play solo but not everyone's a solo gamer well, and I almost, what almost didn't, there, there was a reason I almost didn't put this on there is because with the campaign, generally it's a one time through. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, can an essential game be something that's a one time through and then not get played again? Yeah. What, what ended up putting it on here though, is if you put this with Gloomhaven. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, hell, I'm, I've been playing the crap out of Gloomhaven and I'm still playing it, you know? So, I mean you get into a big campaign like that and mm-hmm. I can play it solo. Um, well, I mean, then you even, yeah. you run into the thing of like, okay, if you beat it, then it's like, well, I want to play a different character. Like I've started three right. different campaigns of Gloomhaven. I have my solo one for the channel that I fucking haven't done, <laughs> but, uh, and then I'm doing another one where I'm playing a different character. And that just makes it like, I've played that opening black borrow scenario especially because I got it on Steam so many different times, but playing different characters just means you're playing it a different way. Right. It's like playing Skyrim over and over, and you're like, I'm going to do a mage this time. I'm going to do a rogue, and then it, you just play it different. So right. it's a different experience. So, yeah. So, yeah, that's my number three. Awesome. Yeah, good good pick. But you should also mention that this tutorial is uh, easily the best in any game. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> because I – well, and I mean – and we've said this before, if you've watched any playthroughs, like I openly hated Gloomhaven mm-hmm. because of my first two tries of it because I couldn't yeah. uh, hand manage it was, your... was like the worst thing in the world. It's one of my most disappointing games. Most yeah, games. that was your emo phase. <laughs> right. Well, and, then, and then I was like, well, let's try this. And then and the, the way that they walk you through those first four or five missions, mm-hmm. and it's like, oh, and then just clicks. And now like Gloomhaven is one of my favorites, you know, so. This, this was very wise. Uh, yeah. To put this yeah. Out. And apparently, well, one, he's going on Kickstarter for miniatures. Not necessary. Um, I have seen people comment and they're really hoping he doesn't hide any like gameplay stuff behind it. I think that would be super shitty to do. So I'm hoping it's just an accessory miniatures thing, which you don't need. I actually kind of like the fact that player characters are minis and the monsters are standees. Right. But if you, so that's coming out, but I have heard, I think it was the, I want to say the Dice Tower mentioned it, but that the booklet that he did for Jaws of the Lion, he's doing for Gloomhaven and Frosthaven. Oh, that'd be so nice. Yeah. (laughs) I would pay a pretty good penny for it too. That's the thing. It's like, if it's an add-on for shit, I don't give a crap how much. I mean, Mm -hmm. the ease of us, how, how. I, you know, me knowing how much time I've taken with Gloomhaven, and then when we've been playing this on your channel, and just yeah. open a book, open up a book, go. 
Yeah. yeah god and it's like it doesn't look like crap those tiles suck yeah like they're so they're blue or brown that that is it with with a broken hilt in the corner <laughs> like that's it there's no detail but the <laughs> jaws of the lion has that booklet and it's just like oh well, what's the scenario oh okay like i guess the only downside for some people is that you you see everything but you see everything when you're setting up the scenario anyway yeah like so unless you're using the app specifically that hides that stuff or you're playing the video game on steam it doesn't it doesn't show you then that's just something that you're gonna have to deal with but that booklet oh my god it's like oh what page is, is it 13 14 and then that extra one for the bottom boop boop all right we're done like man so i'm 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 waiting for waiting for that i'm i would guess kickstarter is where it's i i hope because then otherwise it's gonna sell out like immediately or there unless they do pre-orders on his pay on their you page. could but some people do pre-orders limited which is weird yeah so but yeah i i multiple sources ha i have now been told directly or have heard that that book system for the maps is coming to gloomhaven and frosthaven yes that'd be wonderful all right. My number two, I, this is the one that I thought was going to be a crossover. So I'm, I would imagine it's going to be on your list and this is my card drafting game. Uh, so I had dice drafting for role player. This was the one that I chose for uh, card drafting and it is also my civilization game. And that oh, is, actually, you know what? Sorry. There's, there's, there's oh, Hey, yeah, there's the, <laughs> Hey, look, there's Gloomhaven Jaws on the line. Yeah, yeah, sorry about that. All right, and here is your number two. <laughs> yep, <laughs> Seven Wonders <laughs> is, uh, this was the one that I was like, you know, out of uh, out of all card drafting and drafting games in general. Now, this is definitely not a gateway game. Once again, I have to reiterate that the essential games aren't our are gateway games. Um, this one, uh, this one is just, fantastic and like whenever you are uh just playing a card drafting game which i love it's there's just so many options and avenues to victory which is a huge thing for me whenever i want to play games is i don't want to feel like there's a meta or that you're railroaded into a specific way to play um because then what's the point especially if there's a meta then it's like okay i guess i'll do that and then i'll win it's like that that isn't fun to me this one does not have that. There's multiple ways to get victory points, multiple ways to um, build your civilization. And you go through three ages and you're slowly acquiring resources. You, uh, if you get specific cards in the next ages, you can get cards for free instead of having to pay for them. If you don't have that card, well then, I mean, you can still pay for it. You can use money and your neighbors uh, to pay for their resources but then you're giving them money, uh, which they need to, uh, to do, you know, various actions, but you can, uh, take like, so whenever you draft a card, you can either play it, uh, you can burn it for, uh, money, or you can use it to build a stage of your wonder, which then gives you a benefit, but you can go for, uh, guild cards, which are purple, which give you victory points for a specific, um, like whatever condition it might be. Uh, military, which if you have higher military, then you get increasing amount of victory points. Um, you can go for, yeah, blue, which just tend to be victory points by themselves. Science gets you a bunch for set collection. There's just so much here. And if you're wanting a pure card drafting game, this is it. Like, and the fact that num number of players does not matter. Like, well, in the second edition, which I specifically chose, um it it three which i like this at three i like most uh card drafting games and stuff like this at three because everyone's a neighbor to everyone <laughs> so uh but you can play it up to seven and it'll take the same amount of time as it took a three-player game the scoring will take the longest but it's this one's just extremely solid and then if you add the expansions in it just gives it more depth so that's my number two, Seven Wonders. Yes, that's a very, very good pick. All right. So my number two is going to be um, 
a it's a cooperative game, but I'm making it my solo pick. Oh, um, this, okay. This this is my solo game that that uh, I feel it fits with this because um, it is a card game. You don't have to own everything for it. Uh, when you buy the expansions, it's already pre-ready to go. You don't have to have every expansion to play. Um, and that's Marvel Champions. Nice. Um, this is one of those games, if you have the base game, uh, you don't have to have every hero pack. If you don't like mm-hmm. if you don't like Captain America, don't buy Captain America. You Whatever yeah. deck that you buy is already a, has a pre-constructed deck. And you can go through and, and do that. Um, yep, this was my... I consider this one, this was going to be my uh, LCG kind of pick. It was either right. that one or Arkham Horror. I didn't pick either because the footprint, if you're not, if you're not there at the beginning, then you're playing some significant catch up. Oh yeah. So that was kind of, that was what deterred me from putting it on here, but it definitely was considered. And this one was picked over uh, Arkham as a consideration. Yeah. I had Arkham as, as was up there with my cooperative. Um, okay deal but uh this one being because i play this game solo pretty much about 99 percent of the time yeah um and i can't remember do you run one or two heroes i've done it both i prefer okay. two because um because that way i can run a character that because i love iron man so like okay. i can run a character that has set up yeah. And then the other one can kind of maintain while the other one's setting up. You know, I can try to do stuff like that. Um, that way I'm not as hindered with if one's in alter ego. I mean, like if you're in alter ego, you, you can kind of balance yeah, it out. Yeah, a little yeah. more. But anyway, right. so, um, but yeah, for this one, just because of all the LCGs that have come out, because I, I looked at a lot of them like you did and, and uh this one has a easy point of entry. I mean, you can just buy what you want and play. I mean, you don't have to have everything. It's not a complete narrative storyline. You know, the only storylines they have in this game are, are enclosed in those, those boxes yeah. that come out. Um, so you can just kind of put it down and play. Um, and then if you want to deck build, you can, you don't have to at all because they have their pre-cons. Mm-hmm. So um but yeah, this one is is a very very good uh, solo game to jump into for sure. You know, with a wide variety of expansions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. This is uh, this is one of the few that every time a new hero comes in, then I'm like, okay, and I'll just set it up. It's very quick to set up, and uh, yeah, I do have every hero for it just because yeah, I I. So far, I've liked almost every single one of them. And then, yeah, I would probably, if I was going to pick a solo game, this might have been considered. Yeah, probably, because I do end up playing it. I, I like it at two, just because I like playing with another person. I have tried it at three. It wasn't bad, but it was, well, surprisingly, it wasn't as long as you would have expected, just because so many heroes have tons of ways to dish out a bunch of damage that the increased health of the villain is kind of the same depending on number of players you know because right. you, you just deal that much more damage but but yeah it's it's not ideal two or one i i would agree yeah this is a good pick yep, yep. all right do you have a guess on my number one the number one essential game that i think <laughs> everyone should have what have you not said? I will give you a hint. It is a cooperative game. Have I played it? You have. Do I like it? No. Does it have a lot of versions of it? It does. Oh, yes. So now, are you just doing the base? So are you just doing regular Pandemic? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, my number one is... is oh, uh, oh, hey, there's your picture. Sorry. I'll get better at that, I promise. <laughs> no, you're fine. <laughs> is uh is regular is base pandemic. I wasn't including legacy or anything in that. And uh which was weird. It was very hard for me to like I said, I had a lot of co-ops. Like I included I considered Chronicles of Crime, Mansions of Madness, Eldritch Horror, um other stuff. 
townsfolk tussle. Um, like I considered a lot of a lot of co-ops, and I I knew pandemic was gonna be whenever I because I did the ranking off uh, pub meeple, mm -hmm. um, and when pandemic hit number one, I was like, yeah. Yeah. Now, maybe not in 2020 or 2021. <laughs> People aren't too keen to run out and play a game that represents real life anymore. Um, yeah. But this one is it's just so welcoming, like to to jump into the hobby. This was one of the very first games I owned. I still have regular pandemic and most of the versions. I think the only one I don't have are is the rising tide because it's garbage oh and the dice one i don't have that one either i, like but I have the cthulhu yeah i and uh, uh a friend of mine he was mentioning it the other day that he likes the dice one his favorite is iberia and out of the the versions iberia is my favorite uh not counting legacy they're their own separate they're obviously better but um but this one just the fact that it's cooperative everyone like is important whenever you're playing like everyone has a special ability that is useful the ebb and flow of how this game works of the roller coaster kind of feel just just works so well and you the the difficulty levels of whenever you're playing in this is like depending on who you're playing with you might do four epidemics and then if you're playing with you know more gamery people then you can be like okay well let's put in all six it's it's just so so nice that everyone has something that they are able to do that con uh, contributes to um like to the success of the team and i mean even if you're playing really well the deck can just really just hose you but then you're you just have to be able to play efficiently to like i've never played a game where decisions that we made like uh like Oh, sorry. I've never played a game of Pandemic where the deck just absolutely screwed you through no fault of your own. Like you essentially made decisions at some point that led to the collapse of the world. Right. So, and and the fact that you don't you can eradicate diseases to make it way easier on yourself, but you don't have to. But if you can, might as well. Uh, the vast amount of characters that you can play, it's just. Because once you play this, like this is still kind of gateway, a little higher than that, but it, it's something that I believe everyone should just have on their uh, on their shelf because you're gonna get everyone in, involved. So, right. um, I didn't even consider. <clears throat> I mentioned it earlier, but I didn't even consider it because I technically don't even own it. Uh, Ticket to Ride, but I was right. like, I I don't know. I just feel like cooperative games lend itself to be i i think more inviting than competitive but that's just me so yeah. that is my number one essential game pandemic <laughs> all right do you know what mine is uh it's certainly not it's seven wonders <clears throat> yeah yeah hey you got the first edition on here <laughs> yeah um so uh and there really is not any difference other than just how you lay your cards out on Pretty it much. but and the art um, yeah but i mean that's this is my another one of those games that i've played tons and tons it's my wife's favorite game um and uh this one the card drafting this was kind of the in my mind because i know there was some before this but this was kind of the card drafting game that mm -hmm. really got that mechanic going um and uh it's just so good, you know, the, <laughs> how you're, you, you have to make those choices of what, cause you can still burn cards to get money mm -hmm. um, and stuff like that. The whole drafting and, and passing the cards around to try and you have to pay attention to other people um, just yeah. to make sure so you can hate draft just like you can and duel and all that stuff. Yeah. But uh, if you do too much of that, you kind of hose yourself because th those resources that you get to build shit only really happen in the first eight, first age for sure, second age uh, about half the time, and then there's no mm -hmm. resources in the third age. So you have to spend your time building up those first couple of ages. In or order are there to... not? Are there no resources in the third age? No. Nope. Oh, man, I never caught that. 
Yeah. So, I mean, you have to spend your time building up or else you're going to be paying out the ass. Yeah. Um, and, and then what I've, what I do a lot of times on this is I sit back and I, I really pay attention to what the other people are buying because to my neighbors, because if they, if I'm going to need paper down the road and they don't have any paper, then I know I'm not going to be able to do that unless I get it, you know? So it's like, yeah, there's, there's just a lot of variation, a lot of cards, the expansions add a ton to it. Um, there's a nice big stack of, of wonders now that you can go on and all the wonders are double-sided. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's just a ton of different stuff. Um, and, uh, different variations of ways to win. Um, the Armada expansion is the only one that I have, uh, not used yet. I own it, but I have okay. never played it. Um, it's good. And, yeah. Yeah. That's what I hear. Um, and I won't, I haven't played all the modules in Babel. I've only played with a couple of them, but, uh, I don't like but, Babel. Yeah, I do. The, the mechanic, the, the ones I've used out of that box, we thought was okay. I haven't used some of them though, but, but anyway, yeah, this one has to be in your collection. I think if you're starting off as an mm -hmm. essential deal, I mean, there's a lot of iconography, but you pick it up pretty quick after a couple of plays. Yeah. Um, and, uh, it's a simple enough game because you're just taking a card and playing it, taking a card and playing it. Mm -hmm. you know? um, but you also have to look ahead to what you're needing to build. So, you, so it's good for beginners and uh, gamers, like, you know, experienced gamers as well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this was kind of an obvious one. That's why it was my number ones, because it was just like when we said Essential Games, this was the first thing that popped into my head. Mm -hmm. Seven Wonders. Yeah, I I didn't have that. I didn't have like, oh, this is easily number one. Like, I I knew what games I wanted to be on the list, but whenever I did the ranking and how it fell, I was like, I'm happy with that. Yeah. So, all right. So those are our top ten essential games, which is a very vague term. Uh, it's so hard to recommend games to people, especially like the the like the groups that we're in, and it's just like. I, here are my games like what you know what what would I like it's like I don't know I don't know you right and that's right. the thing is like even if they have a bunch of fantasy campaign games that doesn't mean you're gonna because I it's like I love card drafting not every card drafting game I play I like so right. very yep. versatile so if you're watching this and you're like you're looking through this for suggestions you it's it's a judgment call like based off just what we said but these are exactly. the games that I <laughs> will always keep in my collection and you should too. <laughs> so uh, let us know what you think of these games in the comments below. Other than that, like, comment, share, and subscribe and have a wonderful whatever time of day it is for you. Hey everyone, thank you for watching and I really hope that you enjoyed the video. If you would like to see more of my content, go ahead and click that subscribe button and the bell to be notified whenever I upload any new content. If you feel like supporting the channel, you can go ahead and click that Patreon link to be taken to my Patreon and any help is truly appreciated. Other than that, stick around for any, any other run-throughs or reviews or cool top tens or whatever I feel like putting on. Other than that, like, comment, share, and subscribe and have a wonderful whatever time of day it is for you.